Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, uh, we've got all these members that are going through things or their family members are going through things. We thank you, Father, that uh, your hand's upon our people, Lord, all these that I've spoken about that are sick or been in wrecks. And Lord, uh, we're just asking you uh, for some some peace in their lives and some healing in their lives, Father. And we just lift up Vera and we lift up uh, Kayla and her uncle and we lift up uh, Doris as she's going through what she's going through right now, Father, uh, Patty and, and Al and, and their family, Lord. Uh, we, just, we just ask you to just be with all these people and those that are in our body that have been sick. Just help them get restored back to health in Jesus' name. We ask that you bless this message tonight to the nourishment of our spirits in Jesus' name. And if you're in agreement with that, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's, uh, let's go over to the book of Ecclesiastes real quick here. Ecclesiastes <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 1. How many of you know we're coming to an end of, of the year? talk a little bit about that it's not going to be my my whole message but uh there's some things that i usually do at the end of the year and uh maybe even sometimes in the middle of the year but i kind of have a little formula or a little checklist or a sermon that i've i've preached at this church in variations over the years but but it's something that i regularly go back through myself because it helps me it's a tool for me, and maybe it'll help you. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says, To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. So uh, one of the things that... Uh, we get out of this is the fact that there's a season. You know, in, in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, when uh, Noah came out of the ark and he, he did a sacrifice and God placed a rainbow in the sky, formerly the earth that would, had been cursed and was uh, bringing up thorns and it was very hard to cultivate, God changed that uh, and, and he kind of lessened the, the curse that was upon the ground. He said, as long as the earth remains, there will be uh, summer and winter, cold and heat. There will be a time for planting, right? We go over to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. It says, be not weary in, in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you don't faint. So I like that to throw in there too because, uh, you know, not only you reap what you sow, you know, a lot of times we say, you reap what you sow, right? You sow good, you get good. If you reap bad, you get bad. And I believe that's a universal law. It's a, it's a cosmic law that God has put into place. Most diff varying religions have that encoded into their, into their belief system. But God's the originator of it. Amen? And so we see that there's seasons. We see there's, there's timings for everything. And uh, this is good. You know, right, like right now, I don't know if we're having winter can't tell from one day to the other right one day it's hot next day it's kind of cold then it's windy and you know kansas is one of those places that us older people have a little bit of a struggle when we get up here in our 50s and on up because uh i don't know if you all are like this but when the weather starts to change i usually know it a day a day before it happens you know and it doesn't necessarily have to be a major chain it's just a pressure change or whatever it is but i start feeling it in my shoulder that i broke when i was little in my arm and you know, and my ankle, and some of you got your knees and different things, and so we're glad when that season of cold goes away, amen? Uh, now, I'm not, I'm not one of the young people that like the, the heat of the summer. I don't like the summer when it's at its apex, you know, when it's at the top of its game, and it's hotter than blazes, right? <laughs> to me, I just stay in my house and air conditioning, but uh, I don't like the super cold of the winter, like right now is okay for me. I dig it. But the, the point is there's seasons, and there's seasons to plant, and there's seasons to, to you know, water, and there's seasons to reap what you've sown. Amen? And so we're in a season right now, and using this to kind of bring ourselves into the end of the year thing, we have a tendency to want to reset. And I'm not talking about this 
nonsense that the New World Order is talking about, the, the reset. I'm talking about the reset we get when we come to church, when we're, when we're with God's people, when we get in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we're looking also for resets at the end of the year because I don't know about you, but this has kind of been a challenging year for me. Who can raise their hand and say this has been a challenging year? Actually, it's been a challenging several years. You know, and when I go before the Lord a lot of times prophetically and start seeking his face for some of the things that pertain to our church and how things are going to be, uh, uh, normally in the past he used to just tell me things about this church and about Hutch or the surrounding areas. Lately, over the last five, six, seven years, God started telling me things about the whole, the whole earth. And obviously he doesn't give me a, a real in-depth rundown of things. I'm not really at that place where I need to know everything. I just need to know certain things so I can pray right and get in agreement with the people that are speaking and prophesying the right things. But when I go before the Lord the last few years, He hasn't added a whole lot of new stuff to me. Uh, I'm waiting for Him to give me this great revelation. And I go, well, God, what's it going to be like in 2020? He says, it's going to be like this. And I go, 2021. What's it going to be like in 2021? He goes, more of the same, only increasing in intensity. And I come to him this year and I say, God, I'm not saying he might not give me more in depth on this, but when I go to him and I say, what's, what's 2022 going to be like? He says, more of the same with more intensity. I've even ventured out as far as 2024 with God. And I keep hearing, well, things, the evil men and things will wax worse and worse in the world. You know, we, if we're not careful, we tend to lump ourselves in with the world. But we're not of the world. You know, even if the world's going to hell in a handbasket or if everything's breaking loose real crazy in the world, doesn't mean we have to be crazy with it. Doesn't mean we won't be affected to some degree. But you know what? I keep trying to emphasize this, and I hope people will get it in this church, is we've got to look past all the stuff we're hearing on social media and in the news right now. We, we need to be aware of it. We need to acknowledge that it's there. But we need to, as the people of God, to see what's beyond. Even if you have to imaginate what's beyond. You know, when things get really bad and I get really irritated or uptight with what's going on in this season we're in. Now, let me say this real quick before I move forward. Seasons with God are not year by year, although we tend to, to go, well, the first of the year is coming, it's going to be a new uh, reset and a new way of thinking, and I'm just going to make my, uh, what is it, those lists that everybody makes? I don't make those dumb lists. Because I understand that the seasons with God can be two to three years sometimes, like I just told you. But it's, not, it's okay for a mental exercise. It's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But anyway, you know, when I, when I think about this, I think I look towards what God is, is going to bring us into. And in that, I remove myself from the judgment that's hitting the United States and the rest of the world. If you don't think that judgment's hitting right now, you're wrong. If you're listening to prophets that are telling you, oh, bless God, it's going to get all, it's going to get better in the world. It's not. It's not. They're lying to you or they're, they're hoping you say, well, that just, but I felt some of you just go, ooh, because my prophet says this. Well, I'm telling you what, uh, it may be good for you and I as Christians, and we may see some great things if we take our eyes off of what's going on here and put them on Jesus and what he wants to do with us and through us. We can have the time of our life. This should be an exciting time for most of us because it's telling us Jesus is coming back. So, you know, getting our minds right for the year to come it isn't looking to some man or some government or, or system to save us or to make our life better. Amen? If we're going to make our life better, it's going to be through God, through the Spirit of God, through His Word. These are the days when those of us that have been taught faith are going to have to start using the faith that God has given us to shape the world around us. Are you listening? It's like right now, some of us are in these zones physically and everything. And you know what? With our faith, we could possibly do the impossible with God's help and intervention and change physically, uh, mentally, um, not only ourselves, but our scope of influence, the people that we are able to influence in our lives. Every one of us has a scope of influence. 
Okay, God puts people in our past, puts us in people's past so that we can influence them. That isn't to say, Gabe, that we go and tell them, don't do this, don't do that. You shouldn't be, you know, there may be a place for us to give them that kind of interjection, but it's mainly for us to bring the Spirit of the Lord to them so that if they're, if they're thirsty, they can drink. If they're, if they're hungry, they can eat. What do you mean? The Word of God. Because if you give them just your opinions unless it's based on the Word of God and accurate knowledge, then all it is is your opinions. So when I bring this stuff to you tonight and start telling you about what's coming, you can l- listen to this and look at it in two different ways. You can go, gee, he's just preaching bummer stuff. Well, that's where your mind's at because it's tied into the world. I, you know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't acknowledge or, or grieve a little bit for the people of the world or the situation in the world or our countries, however. But you know what? We are citizens of, of heaven, and we are, we are agents of Almighty God in the New Jerusalem. And in spite of what goes on around us, even though we may be touched or our family may be touched, we have an answer. So we are the answer through Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate answer. We have an ability to shape the world around us. Think about that. How? Because we're something? No, because he's something in us. We need to see this, that we have influence. So the thing the devil wants to do is take away your influence this year. He wants to take away your testimony this year. He wants to beat you down. And Listen to me. I've been through seasons as a Christian for 48 years of ups and downs. You say, well, you should just be steady, brother. I wish I could be. But, you know, life hits you in the face sometimes. And sometimes you're you're up to the challenge, and other times you're just getting your your teeth kicked in. Right? The thing of it is, is though even though we're knocked down, it doesn't mean we're completely out. You know, I have a thing on my, my wrist to remind me because I went through some things a few years ago that about broke me. About broke me. And so when I, when I got this particular thing on me, it's Proverbs uh, 24, 16, a righteous man falls seven times but ariseth. It's a resurrection scripture. Amen? Same for a, for a righteous woman. You know what? The devil can knock us down or life can knock us down, but we'll get back up again. You know, we're headed towards something. And on our journey, we're going to see things happen. You know, one of the visions that I had early on when I got saved is I saw the end of, uh, the, end of the age. I'm thinking I'm going to probably be alive when it's here, but if not, I got a glimpse of things. And I'm telling you, if you're looking at it from, from a subjective view which means in the middle of it and not an objective view of the thing that you get when you get a vision from God is you usually get to look from the outside in and it was chaos I'll be honest with you it was kind of scary because I didn't know what I know now I didn't know God like I know so when I saw it it was everything because you know when you get a vision a lot of times or a night vision everything's kind of encapsulated crunched in together so it could be spread out over a period of time but when you see it it seems like it's compressed and it's all happening right now which may or may not be true but the thing that i saw was the chaos that was going to be in the world well the bible tells you about this now this is before i knew much bible too but uh, trust me things are going to get worse and worse where the economic the spiritual false religious even if they call you Christians concerned, things are going to go down a road to bring people who will listen to a point of where they reach out for God. Others are going to be so mad they're going to hate God. We can't be those people that allow that to affect us to the point of where we cut ourselves off from our source. Amen? Because he, in Him we live and move and have our being. All right, so... We're talking about we're coming to an end of a year right now, and the tendency for us is to become hopeful, and I think that's great. You should be hopeful. for. If you want to make your New Year's resolutions, make them all day long. You know, try to make them in line with God's Word and what you know in your heart that God wants you to do. Does that make any sense? And don't count on any government or any... Any governor or anybody that's in, you know, that's caught up into the world system of government, not saying it's all bad, but it's pretty bad. Amen. Don't count on all of that. Count on Jesus. Look for him for your joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord's your strength. I'm finding this out. The older I get, the more and more. 
uh, people are going to disappoint you. People are going to let you down. You know, and a lot of times they don't really mean to. You know what I mean? It's just they're going through stuff. And so uh, the times that we're living in are tough for people. Who hasn't experienced some depression lately? I got both my hands up. I've fought depression since I was 15. I know what depression's like, you know. And people go, well, it's just because you got a chemical imbalance. That may be so, but I actually think I've been depressed at times because there was real reasons to be depressed. Especially if you, if you are empathetic towards people, you have an empathic, uh, intuitive ability to, uh, and most prophetic people and people that pray a lot have this where they can tune in on other people's needs and feelings and and if you don't know how to separate them, they can, they can weigh heavy on you. Or if you care about people, you have to be careful not to cross that line to try to make them be what you want them to be. Or, you know, uh, with us as Christians, we don't, have that, we don't have that right to interfere with people's choice. We can, we can encourage people. We can inform people. We can give them God's word. And we can pray God's will for them. You'll find me a lot of times people will ask me to pray about a certain thing and I'll, I'll tell them straight out, I'll pray God's will in this situation. There's some situations that God's will is plain in his word, but there's some situations when it deals with people's choice, you've got to be very careful how you pray. So we're in your, entering into a new year, but it, with the new year we can get a new mentality, but it's got to be based on more than just the next year. Like, well, I'm going to make this run for the next year. You know, that's how we are with our, with our sometimes uh, unrealistic uh, lists, you know, <laughs> New Year's resolutions. I'm going to lose 100 pounds this year. Boy, would that I could do that, right? Um, maybe 25 would be a little bit closer. Those are, those are realistic things, you know, but there's that supernatural thing. We need to start believing for more of the Spirit to hit. You know how, how the best way to pray for your church to get to get a move of the Spirit is to pray for another church to get it. I mean, don't just pick out another Pentecostal church. Pick out a Baptist church. You know, pick out pick out a Catholic church that they're the farthest thing in the in my mind towards that. But you know, they got a crazy Pope right now that's doing crazy things. Really. He's a Jesuit, and, he, and he's, he's trying to institute some things that'll, that'll suck churches that are not in the spirit, that are even, you know, uh, Protestant churches, into his, his thing that the, the Jesuits have tried to do forever. Pray that there'll be a breakout in the Catholic Church, a new charismatic renewal. When I came to the Lord, things are cyclical, listen to me. When I came to the Lord, it was in the Jesus movement, but there was a charismatic renewal going on at the same time. My mother-in-law's church was, was a spirit-filled church, and we had miracles. We had the power of God. We had uh, the moving of the Holy Spirit. We didn't have a lot of great word like we got now. I think sometimes, though, that word kind of gets everybody all fisticated or something. I don't know. But, but we had the move of the Spirit. I saw things that blow your mind that were of God. One of the things that blew my mind is our church would get filled up once a month with a bunch of Catholics that would come from the Catholic church over to our church, when, especially when there were special speakers or we'd have camp meeting. And they could fill the Holy Ghost, fall out under the power, and you'd, you'd think, well, they're just going to quit the Catholic church and join the Protestant church. No, but they'd go back to their church and they'd get more people to come back the next month. So, so there's a move of the Spirit that's happening right now, but it's going to increase because we can't, in my way of thinking, can't get out of here until we have the convergence. You know, until we have that early and latter rain convergence and a big move of God. We need to be excited and looking at that instead of going, I wonder who's going to be the next president. At this point, I don't care. Will you vote? Yeah, absolutely I'll vote. But right now, I don't care. I care about Jesus getting in our nation. And if another president will help bring him in here, great. But if not then he's just a part of the system, no matter who he is or she is. Saying, keep your eyes right on Jesus. You know? And if Jesus' will is for this to happen out here in the government, then praise the Lord. You know? Worship God for that. Um, I'll tell you, we've got to get our minds right. We're living in a time of, of reformation. I really believe that what's going on right now can bring reformation to the church. 
not only to our nation or nations of the world. I think freedom-loving people are seeing how quickly the mark of the beast could come in. All of this stuff with the COVID thing and the shots and all, it's just a precursor to, to the control that will eventually be put into place. Is the COVID shot the mark of the beast? I don't think so at all. Okay? Uh, I, I'm not going to preach on end times, but I could tell you why it's not. But still, the idea of somebody trying to force you to do things against your will, you know, and trying to tell you you've got to be this way, you've got to be that way, when it's your divine right to have control over your body and uh, other things, uh, you know, your inalienable rights, and when they're violating so-called constitution and things. So the point is, is, is everything's being put in place as far as the, the social media, the, the propaganda machine, all of that stuff's there. It, is, it isn't that far of a stretch if you can get the whole world to destroy their economy over fear of something that's no worse than, than influenza, which is pretty bad. I've had it for the last month, you know. Just saying, does that mean we, we got to be stupid? No. I'm just saying that, that this, is, this, is, this thing right here should wake everybody that's a Christian up and let them know that we are so close to Jesus' return. Not so close to the Antichrist coming. He's already here. If he's, not, if he's not already a man, he's a young man. You listening? He's here. Okay? But even if he wasn't here in physical form yet, he's here in spirit. Because even in the old days, many spirits of Antichrist were in the world in those days. But I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I could give a, lip, a rip or a flip who he, who he is. He's an alien. I don't know what he is. I don't really care. Because if, if you study eschatology the way I did, the church is going to be out of here when he's revealed. And you can't, you can't take a mark which will damn you to hell for all eternity until you bow down to, a, to this person called the Antichrist. So I'm not really looking for him. I'm looking for Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. When I see all of this, it's making me go, man, you know what? I better get my act together because Jesus is coming again soon. I better try to, try to encourage my family and my friends that they need to take a look at their heart and they need to get their mind right with God. Amen? Uh, I'm one of those that believe in pre-tribulation partial rapture view. You mean, what's that? I wish we'd all been ready, the, the ten virgins. And, you know, whether I'm right or wrong in that, I'm, I'm not the only preacher that believes that way, but I'd rather, I'd rather be a little more extreme and be wrong than be uh, just cavalier about the whole thing. But you're spreading fear, brother. No, I'm not. The people that are saying, you got to go through the tribulation period, those people are the ones that are spreading fear. They're stealing the blessed hope that the book of Titus talks about. Amen? And so I, I want to I hold on to that blessed hope. And I do that when I pull my mind back out of what's going on and go, you know, not that I like to see people suffer. Not that I get joy out of watching Bible prophecy coming to pass. Wars and rumors of war, famine and pestilence, you know, and, and, and these kind of, I don't get any joy out of that, but what I do get is the joy of seeing that and it reminding me that Jesus is coming. And what I do, I must do now. Amen? How I live is so important right now. <clears throat> Does it save me or not save me? No, but it'll save my mind from condemnation. It'll put me in a place of readiness where I'm ready to, to, to be used by God to touch other people. Because if I become a black hole of self-absorption where all I am is seeing me, I, I, I'll miss the people that God sends around me to touch. Does that make any sense? Pastor, that's too strong. No, it's not strong enough. So, we're in a time of reformation. And I think, you know, we're looking for a revival. We're looking for a refreshing. We're looking for a move of God. And God says all these things are going to be. Okay? So most of what people call revival is basically a desire to see God show up with power. How many of you want to see the things you hear the forefathers talk about? I, I can't wait till, till I start seeing a, I've seen some over my life. I've experienced some, but not in the amount that I want to see. Okay, and, and you cannot make these things happen. God has his hand on the anointing dial with me or anybody else. Okay, what you can do is position yourself for readiness. 
you can get yourself ready. So when we talk about revival that is to come or, or a move of God or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I think the thing that we need to focus on right now in this transition period, in this time of resetting for the next year, is where we're at in our mindset and in our walk with God. Amen? So personal revival is something that needs to happen regularly with us. I don't know about you. Maybe you just stay up on top of the mountain all the time. I mean, life is happening to me. I don't know if it's happening to you. I got kids, grandkids, friends, church members, people that pull on you. Their, their life pulls on you. What goes on with them pulls on you if you love them, right? Come on. Some of you have all seen your family members go through stuff. It messes with you, doesn't it? it, may, it and when you pray these strong prayers of faith and it doesn't seem like anything immediately happens, it challenges you to believe God. Does it or does it not? And every once in a while, I kind of get upset about the whole thing. And like today, what I had to do is I had to just kind of take some time. I took about an hour of my time today because me and God have been having this thing that we just haven't been addressing. Any of you married people know what I'm talking about. There's this elephant in the room. You can get along kind of, but there's still something that needs to be resolved. That's kind of how it's been for me at times with God. Uh, I don't really want to get into it because I still got the emotion and I'm still kind of bugged or I'm even angry at times. So today I took some time and I was like, okay, uh, you don't seem like you're talking to me real loud and clear. You know, he'll talk to me about you all day long. If I pray for you, and I don't mean he's telling me your stuff. I just mean if I, if I pray and I'm seeking God for you or I'm praying for some bread for you, God answers really good, okay? But when it's for me, how many of you experience that? I can pray for other people and stuff happens, but when it's for me, it's a whole other ball game, okay? Uh, and that's good in some respects because then other people need to pray for us and we're just not the Lone Ranger, right? So I love it when I can't get my faith to, or my belief system, my faith to, to take care of a problem. Other people are praying for me and sometimes the problem resolves itself not because I've done anything, but because other people are in your court, amen? But I, I was in that place today and I just said to God, I was like, you know, um, it would really be cool if we would have a two-way communication here. But since we're not, I'm just going to say all these feelings and these things that seem to be unresolved in me, you already know my heart, so I don't need to go into you know, the Jim Long, <laughs> Long version of it. I'm like, you already know how I feel on the inside. You know where I'm at. And I, I, just, I, want, I want our relationship to be right again. And I know... I got things to do to, to get to that place where it's right again. And you're saying, Pastor, you? Yeah. Yeah, just because you're a pastor don't mean you don't have the same challenges with your faith and with your relationship as other people. Amen? Uh, it's not only your relationship, because you got other people dependent on you too, just like you parents, you know. But I, I just said to the Lord, I said, you know, no matter what it is that I think you're wrong about, I know I'm wrong and you're right. Let's just, let's just go there, God. I don't understand everything, and you're not giving me the long version of why you're not moving or this isn't happening. I'm just going to blanketly trust you. No matter how my formulistic faith or walk of faith is, I'm just going to trust you, and no matter what it comes or goes or how things work, I'm going to do my best to just believe that you'll fix it, or you'll, if you don't fix it, then I just have to deal with it. This is a problem of being in the faith movement back when I was. I, some of you, are, you've got the, I think, the more balanced version being in this church, because Pastor Kelly and I and Pastor Craig now, we've never preached the extreme faith. We've utilized some of their teaching, but we've never been in the extreme, oh my gosh, because I had somebody the other day, I said something about being sick online, and this person goes, well, if you, if you really believe Yahshua, they have to go into their, their messianic everything, you know, you would be, but you're, you're supposed to be a man of God, and look at you, you're sick, and you're not healed by faith. And I was, I was going, yeah, you're about 20 years old, and you've been a Christian for three years. Because when I was 20, I could think like that too, because I didn't get sick. Why aren't you healed, bless God? Don't you know that you're healed in Jesus' name? Yeah, you're only 20, 
And you never hardly get sick because, you know, unless you break your leg or something at that age, you're invincible, right? It's easy to believe for divine health when you're 20 years old and don't have any problems. But get 67 or more and see how, how it goes. You know what I mean? It's, it's like a constant battle because I don't care how much faith you have. If you live long enough, your body's going to break down and you are going to die. I don't care how nice you are, how, how uh, saintly you are. It's appointed unto man wants to die. And to do this, your body's got to degenerate over years. I think you can do it gracefully, but, but understand where I'm coming from there. I'm not trying to take away your ability to believe for supernatural healing at any age. I'm just saying, quite frankly, there's some things that we just need to be real about. Believe for the best, but when the best isn't coming, for whatever reason, we have to trust God. We just have to trust God. No matter what. Mentally, physically. I'm believing for things this side of heaven. David said... I would have fainted unless I believed I'd see the goodness of God in the land of the living. But it's not always perfect for whatever reason. And I'm not even going to take the time to go, well, what's my problem? What sin am I in? How much faith do I have? Did I believe in God or am I? The you know what? I've been down that road and it really doesn't resolve anything. The easiest thing for me to do, for me to do, maybe it'll work for you, is to just do what I said that I do with God on a regular basis is just go, well, I'm kind of bugged about this. You know how I feel on the inside, but ultimately you're God and I submit to your will. And if there's anything that seems like you're wrong in, I know that you're a righteous God and I'm wrong and you're right. Wouldn't you wives like that if we just did that, if us men did that all the time? Anyway. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Still with me? Or have I lost y'all? Okay. So revival is basically the desire to see God show up with power and do major miracles and unusual displays of signs and wonders. But that's not really revival, okay? It's a move of God. So what's revival, Pastor? Revival deals with us. We're thinking, you know, the United States just needs to get revived. Well, what do they need to be revived in? Their 1776 mentality and constitution i'll go with you on that there needs to be a revival of of our belief system as a nation uh there needs to be a revival of of god's uh, people you know getting to the place where they remember that they're agents of of the kingdom of gods you know kingdom agents to to help lead people to christ but when it comes down to a move of god and a revival of god they're two different things and when the early and latter rain gets poured out, so to speak, in the first month, it's all about a move of God, a power move of God that is going to make things that are hard to believe for happen quickly. It's going to be like the gift of faith. And I don't know if you understand this according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit. And there's the power gifts. You know, there's, there's the gift of faith which you need to do miracles. There's a gift of faith that you need to do unusual miracles and healings, you know. And that gift of faith, is it, it goes right along with those other two gifts of the Spirit because my normal faith, my believer's faith, can move mountains. It can get people healed. It can call miracles in. But when I'm ministering to people, if I want to see something that's beyond my ability at that moment to believe for, even though it's possible in the Word of God then God has to drop something on me. God has to drop something on me. And that's the gift of faith. That causes you to be supercharged. And you're like, pull a guy out of a wheelchair? Heck yeah. Don't do it if you don't have that on you. You know what I mean? People have done that and they've created more problems. When my wife was a young girl, she'd have these ministers come in and, and they'd take people's glasses and smash them, you know, and people would be going, that's when you need to go to that, that, that minister and go, well, you know what, if you took my glasses and you smashed them, then you need to give me a new pair of glasses or get me healed. Because you're just presuming faith, foolishness, or presumption. But when you got the gift of faith, you know that you know. And I've seen people with that before because I've been sitting there going, well, I don't know, man. I'm, I mean, my belief isn't at that level right now. And they're like, I know it's going to happen. And you're like, well, I'm glad you do. You make the move then. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, let's, let's go to this. So, so a move of God is what, what uh, 
what we want to see when it comes to the early and latter rain movement, this end time movement that's going to bring a lot of people in a short amount of time into the body of Christ. Believe you me, the Jesus movement that I lived through was a big thing. It, it ushered lots of people into the kingdom of God. And there were miracles and there was, there was unity among uh, young Christians that wasn't among the older Christians. And I won't go into the whole thing of it, but it was amazing to see what God was doing, primarily through the young people. Doesn't mean the older people weren't doing things too, but a lot of times older people, they get in their church, they get in their ways, and they're like, well, you know, our doctrine says this, our church uh, instrument of organization says this, and we don't budge from it. And I see it all the time. You start trying to tell people about the moving of the Spirit, and they're like, no, God quit doing that. Really? Who Says who? You? Well, I have an experience, so it must not be possible. Well, that means, you know, uh, over, over millions of people, and not just people that, that are crazy and weird, but we're talking educated people, have experienced the things of God, the moving of God's Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, supernatural visitations and dreams. Just because you don't believe it, all of their, all of their testimonies are null and void? Where do people get the arrogance sometimes? And, and, and it, would, it would be okay if it wasn't in the Word of God. But the problem is it's in the Word of God. And it doesn't say when it's going to stop except when he that is perfect, which is Jesus, comes back. Those things that are in part, the, the glass we're looking through darkly, then it'll be done away with because then we're going to see open-faced. We're going to see Jesus. And so to me, I'm not a real educated person other than self-educated. I'm like, well, that's what it says. It makes sense to me. Why, why would... Why would you, with that triple doctrine on your wall, why can't you see that? Because a religious system gets people caught up into things, and doctrine of men and their interpretations that may be outside of the true doctrine of God and the true uh, interpretation of the Holy Spirit, who doesn't have 20 interpretations. At the most, you can see two to three things when you look at the Word of God, but they're all seeing the same thing from different angles. Get that. And they'll all still, I might see it from this angle and give you a different, a different way of, of explaining it, but you'll get it over here and you'll explain it in a little bit different way, but the conclusion will still be the same if it's by the Spirit. Are you listening to me? You know, I can preach a sermon uh, along the lines I'm preaching right now. Pastor Craig could preach it and you'd still hear the same just you still come to the same uh, conclusion in it, amen? But, but if it's based on the Word of God, it may be another person's way of explaining or different um, metaphors or whatever to, to get the, the message across, but the end result will be the same if it's the Word of God and it's the Spirit of God. All right, number one, let's look at this. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, Repent ye thee for, therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So when the times of refreshing, note that word refreshing. So when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. There is a time of refreshing in these end times. You know, the Bible says to be filled with the Spirit. It, it's giving you the indication in the Greek to be being filled. Be being filled. What do you mean? It means it's, it's a constant flow. Once you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you can continue to be filled with the Holy Ghost over and over again. Amen? Uh, we're kind of cracked pots. You know, it leaks out over a while, if you will. You know, unless you stay in the presence of God. And sometimes that's very difficult to do. So let me get over to Acts here. Yeah. Acts chapter 3. So Peter said to all these religious people and the people that were in Jerusalem at the time of the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he said, Repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So when the times of refreshing shall come from the, the presence of the Lord. You know, something that always kind of blew my mind when you go and you look at what happened in the garden, how that man fell. And you know, when, when man was made, God breathed, in, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, which was an exchange of the Holy Spirit, which animated and made that, however God did it, made that man into a cognitive being 
separate yet still unified with God. And then they fell. And so when it talks about breath, because the Holy Spirit is, is uh, sometimes synonymous with breath or fire or wind, right? So when they fell, there was a separation. There was a cutting off from that source. And so in dying, you shall die. And all that time from, from the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3.15 all the way down to when Jesus came to, to bring us and died on the cross so that we could be reconstituted, so we could be refreshed, so that we could be brought back and we could receive the breath of God again. So when the Holy Spirit came, He came as a rushing mighty water. Came as a rushing mighty wind. And He filled the house. And He filled them. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, He fills you. He re you get a recovery of breath. The breath of God. And it, it, it causes something. Uh, the Bible talks about it, I think, in Matthew, uh, Matthew 19, and verse 18. Jesus says, those that follow me, when he was speaking to his, his disciples who said, Lord, we've left everything to follow me. He says, those that follow me in the regeneration will receive all these benefits, houses, cars, and friends, and family, and yada, yada. He said, in the regeneration, I'm going to try and say this word right, but I probably won't. It's palingenesia, which that transliterates into a regenesis. And it's used one more time in, in Titus chapter 3, and I can't remember if it's verse 6 or verse 8, where it talks about the regeneration. Only twice the Bible uses that, that word, palingenesia, which is a regenesis. So think about that. What do you mean regenesis? A recovery of breath. Uh, that's the new birth. That's where the fallen man who was once united with God when he receives Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes into him in the new birth. I'm not talking about just speaking in tongues stuff. I'm talking about the rebirth, the regeneration of your being, your spiritual man, alive unto God again, which was once dead. You following me? So, when Peter's talking about this, the times of restitution, the times of refreshing, uh, it's synonymous with what Jesus was teaching about the regeneration. When he talked to Nicodemus, he said, you know what, you've got to be born again. It's exactly what that, that's all about. There must be the new creation reality in Christ Jesus. The way that happens is repenting of your sins, acknowledging Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, receiving him into your life, confessing him with, his, with your mouth that he is now your Lord, that you have repented and you believe on the new way through Jesus Christ, and something miraculous happens in your being and you become born again. You become re, you, you, you're a part of that regeneration that Jesus is talking about. And the spirit man that was once dead, which just means it was separated from God, is once again connected to the source, Almighty God, through Jesus Christ hate the Sistine Chapels. I think it needs to be redone where man is reaching out to God and God is reaching down here. They need to get Jesus up there grabbing man, man's hand and God's hand and, because he's the celestial go-between between God and man. <laughs> Amen. And, and so it's a beautiful whatever, but God is not still reaching out to man in that way. I mean, he is, but... But through Jesus Christ, the connection can be made. Hallelujah. So, number one, what we need to do, if we, we need to repent, right? You need to look at your life this year, at the end of this year. See, see yourself. You know, the Bible says if we judge ourselves, we won't be judged. Are you listening? This is the important part of the message. So, what do you do? You have to reflect. I did that today so I could preach this sermon, but also because me and God needed to have a, have a come to Jesus meeting. Me come to Jesus and him <laughs> be there for me, you know, when I figured out I was wrong and he's right, okay? So reflection, it means to ponder, to meditate. You know, think about, think about where you're at, okay? Evaluate your current position. Where are you headed? The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 26, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. How? Through God, through his word. If you find that you've missed the mark, you know what missing the mark is? It's sin. 
You know, the bullseye's walking straight with God and, and, and being right with him in his word and his will. So if you found that you've missed the mark or you feel like you've missed, because sometimes you feel like you've missed the mark and really God's like, no, nah, I'm cool with you. We need to give Rachel some coffee. She can put me to sleep up here. She's just yawning away. Take a deep breath, honey. <laughs> like Jack LaLanne. How many of you remember Jack LaLanne? Remember that? He'd get that organ going. He'd say, deep breath in. <laughs> I'm teasing you, okay? It doesn't bother me. Um, so reflect, ponder, ponder the path of your feet. If you find you've missed the mark, don't waste your time uh, lamenting on the things that you can't, you can't change from yesterday. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that if I keep, and I do this because, you know, I've been through trauma. You, some, most of you have been through trauma, and sometimes it comes back. I wonder who brings it. Just saying. But you can waste your time by focusing on all that all the time, and you miss what's ahead of you. This isn't something, you know, some of you people got your act together in that area, but some of us that have been through things, you know, we go through it from time to time. It's cyclical for us. There's things that trigger us, so to speak, and it takes our mind back there, but we got to learn to, and I have learned, to drag my mind back over here. The greatest thing that ever happens to me when I'm like that is somebody will call me with a bigger problem than I got. I, I mean... When, when I'm sitting there going, I just feel so sick. And all of a sudden, Doris calls me with, with what happened with her today with her husband passing away. It's like, Shh, there's nothing wrong with me. See, she's here tonight. Her husband passed away today. Because you know where she'd rather be when she feels bad? is with the people of God. You might go, well, it doesn't bother her? Of course it bothers her. She buried a husband several years ago. Her first husband, she buried a son a couple of years ago, and now she's burying the, the, the next love of her life. Or, you know, she's going to have to deal with that. But God's people are here for her. And she's here, she's here because she knows that the bread of life is here and the people of God are here. Not, not everybody's got that kind of strength. But you know what? You follow God long enough, you get that kind of strength because her hope isn't just in what's going to happen tomorrow. Her hope's in what's going to happen in the future. And she's going to be reunited with all these people that she's loved that's went before her because they're safe with God. Isn't that right, Sue? It's a mind-blowing thing. The other day I was, in, uh, was out there at Carriage Crossing, and I saw a guy in a hat with, his, with a, uh, with a camouflage coat and a beard, and I go, Lord, Lord, Warren. He looked, he looked like a thinner version of Warren. And I, it might have been the same, it might have been the same guy. I was like, and of course, immediately, because Warren was my friend or is my friend, I'm going to see him again. I start thinking of him, and I was like, missing him immediately. But you know, I'm going to see him again. We're going to see him again. Amen. Uh, so. <laughs> See, some of you might go, how can you talk about those things? Well, what, what are we going to do? Ignore them and deny that they're happening? Because they do happen. It's how we look at them from the point of, of view of what we're going to do and what we're going to be in the future and the people we're going to see again. So if you found that you missed your mark, don't waste tomorrow by lamenting on your yesterdays. Philippians 3, 10 through 14 says that we should forget what lies behind and press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I know the scripture is used so much, but it's such a powerful tool uh, mentally for you. It's a, it's a weapon of warfare for us to go, okay, that's then. I can't do any, you know, I can't recapture the years that I lost. I did dumb things. I broke boundaries. I hurt people. People hurt me because of my choices that I put myself in situations. Some things were perpetrated on me. I had no, no power to stop them or, or anything. And, and I can let those totally damage me for the rest of my life. Or I can see the future that God has for me. Because I'm convinced of this. When I get, maybe even before I get to heaven, hopefully, but when I get to heaven and I see Jesus, all of these things that were bad are going to be put in perspective. They're not going to touch me any longer. Do you understand that? They're, 
They're not going to have an ability to touch me any longer. I talk about the tapestry of grace and that our tapestries are made up of good threads and bad threads. Amen. And from the backside where we're at right now, it looks like a tangled, mangled mess. But if we could see it from God's point of view, you can make out what he's trying to make over here. The Bible says we're his workmanship. That word you've heard Pastor Craig and I use it many times is poema. We are a beautifully, carefully crafted poem or picture that God is making. And when we get into heaven, even all the bad threads, because he causes all things to what? Work together for the good of those that love him that are called according to his purpose and plan. So if you decide you don't want to be called according to his purpose, you don't want to do his will, then the bad things, they, they're, they're overwhelming. But if you're called according to his purpose and will and you trust him, eventually things are going to make sense even if they don't this side of heaven. We have to believe that. Or we won't make it as things get more intense. We must be convinced of our salvation and who's... Who, who we serve. Amen? I think it's so important. This cannot be a fairy tale. This has got to be reality. So we need to re reflect. Here's some important questions to reflect upon. Is God consuming me? Or am I a black hole of self-absorption? Is ever all my thoughts and focus on me and my problems? Or am I pushing them aside or resolving them with the Holy Spirit's help? Or working on them. You know, there's some things I've been working on for years. And so we pull it out of the closet, and me and the Holy Ghost work on it. And then we, when I get burned out, or he gets burned out, he never gets burned out. We put it aside, and I move on. And you know, and somewhere down the road, we pull it back out of the drawer because something will happen, and I'll think that I'm done with that problem, but it'll hit me in the face again, or that person that I need to forgive will come up again, and I got to forgive them all over again. Even though initially I've made the choice to forgive people, the feelings and the hurt doesn't always immediately go away. You need to remember that when you're ministering to people. Well, you just need to forgive and forget. Impossible to forget certain things that happen to you unless somebody uh, does a lobotomy on you and pulls out part of your brain. Amen? But you can get a different perspective on them as you let them go and let the Lord heal you, and you can learn to see them from a different point of view. Try stepping out of yourself, uh, you know, your black hole of self-absorption once in a while and looking at the situation and the person from an objective point of view instead of you in the middle of it. And try to figure out why they did what they did. What motivated them? How, I mean, what caused them to be brought to that type of behavior? Doesn't absolve them of the behavior. You know, I'm seeing some of these high-profile court cases right now being done and everybody's saying yada 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 and you know what that person deserves to go to jail and whatever they violated uh, other people on but you know people also need to instead of throwing rocks need to step back and go well you know they molested somebody they probably got molested like crazy that doesn't make it okay but it's human injustice that's perpetrated on people that causes people a lot of times to do the same to other people and so what can I do to be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem? You know, maybe we can't recover that situation, but there's a situation looming somewhere. Where can, where can God interject me to help that from happening again? Well, first of all, you can, you can be good with your kids and your, your family members. You can treat people right. You know, one of the best things that ever happened to me, I didn't think it was so at the time, I don't know if I should say this, but I'll say it. I was engaged to somebody before I met my wife. Loved her like you wouldn't believe. I thought I loved her. She played games with my heart. Hurt me really, really bad. Needless to say, thank you, Jesus, I never married that girl. Because a, a year and a half, two years later, I met my wife. And we've been married uh, this, this coming June 46 years. We were together a year and a half before we got married. I can't imagine being married to anybody else, period. If something happened to my wife, I would never get married again. That's me. I'm, that's not for any of you. That's me because I love my wife so much. I can't imagine being with anybody else. But that thing devastated me. And you know what? The hurt was so bad, I thought, I never want to hurt another person like I got hurt. I, I, got, I got beat up really good one time, and I used to like to fight a lot. 
as long as I was winning. <laughs> but when I got monkey stomped by three guys from a gang, and, and, and I mean, I got hurt really bad, I kind of I rethought the whole fighting thing and decided the only time I would fight, unless really pushed, was if somebody was threatening somebody I love or was threatening me. So my fighting went from here to almost nothing. You know why? Because I found out it does, it's not fun to have stars and birds tweeting in your head and, you know, teeth through your lip and fractured ribs and your face hanging out to here. It's just, it's just not fun. It takes too long to recover. Amen? So sometimes some of these bad things that happen to us, they, God can bring good out of them. You say, well, that, that, that's kind of a bad example, Pastor. No, for me it was a good example. I learned some good lessons. Anyway, some of you can think back to that. Uh, things that have happened to you. So reflect. The answers will help you locate where you stand. Is God consuming you or are you a black hole of self-absorption? Has God told you to do something that, that you're putting off or refuse to do? Some people want to move forward with God, but they're going to have to go back and do what God told them to do a year ago. Some things are unrecoverable. There's some things you can't recover, so you got to move on. But there's some things that you stop at, and God says, well, you know what? The pro problem isn't me. The problem is you. You need to go back and do what I told you to do. When I, when I backslid, when I came back to the Lord, I started going, well, I'm never going to speak in tongues or give a message in tongues or prophesy again, and I just want to be a Baptist. Nothing wrong with being a Baptist, but I was raised Pentecostal. I'm Assembly of God boy my whole life. I've kn all I've known is Pentecost or some semblance of it. <laughs> Two weeks back in church, I prophesied, or I gave a tongue, and the next week I, I prophesied. And I told God I never wanted to do it again. You know what? If you want to obey God, you'll do whatever the Spirit of the Lord asks you to do or prompts you to do. And, you know, some of us lose that over time. We get a little bit persnickety and cantankerous with the Lord, and the Lord is saying to some of you, you need to go back to that place where, where you disobeyed me. It may not have even been a big thing. You know, sometimes we think disobedience got to be this mountain. Sometimes it's just a small thing. I thought I told you to go talk to that person there. Do you know how important it is? I had some, I've told the story before, but it bears repeating. I had God one time tell me to witness to this girl, very pretty girl. Um, I wasn't looking at her for a, for a girlfriend, but I knew her because I had gone steady with her cousin. So I knew who she was, but she'd grown up. And I was, I was hyper, hyper faith. I would tell anybody about Jesus. I mean, I just would witness to anybody. I didn't care. Well, God wanted me to witness to her, but I was like, well, God, you know, I don't want her to think I'm a dweeb and, and weird. I want to, I want to reconnect with her and get to know her. And I'll kind of, cause my way is to kind of work on people over a period of time. Right. And, uh, God says, I want you to talk to her today. I said, okay, but I'll do it, I'll do it, but not today. She went out, got hit by a car, and died that Friday down at the beach. Now, I'm not in condemnation of it, but that's one of those things that you learn a doggone lesson. She was a Jewish girl, so as far as I know, she didn't know Jesus. Nicest, sweetest, prettiest girl you ever want to meet in your life. And she's dead because, and, and didn't get a chance to hear the gospel possibly. Maybe somebody got her down at the beach as a Jesus freak. You know, there's a lot of them running around in my day. But I was disobedient. So guess what I get to live with from time to time? The fact that I made, I, 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 I thought that my choice and my timing was better than God's choice and his timing. Just saying. I don't usually share a lot of these things all the time, but somebody needs to hear that. Okay. What one thing would I eliminate from my life because it holds me back from reaching my full potential in Christ? Think about that. What's God been telling you to deal with? Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a particular way of thinking. What one thing should I eliminate from my life because it holds me back from reaching my full potential in Christ? If my desire and my love for God determined the temperature of the earth, would there be an ice age or global warming? Sometimes it would just be lukewarmness, you know, a lukewarm of coffee. I, I don't know about you, but I hate my coffee lukewarm. 
I complain all the time. I'll nuke some coffee, set it down for a minute, and it doesn't seem to take very long for that cup of coffee to get lukewarm, and it's just like back to the microwave three times. Sometimes my cup of coffee ends up three times. You know, I can drink it ice cold, but I can't stand it lukewarm. And you know what Jesus says? If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. <laughs> now, I don't know what that means exactly, but not liking lukewarm coffee, I can imagine he don't like lukewarm Christians. Does it mean we'll be lost forever? No. It just means, you know what, you're going to be re <coughs> regurgitated and reconstituted or something. I don't know. You know, God gives you chances, but just saying he doesn't... It, He's not pleased when we don't do things his way and we're not on fire for him. If my desire and love for God determine the temperature of the earth, would there be global warming or would there be an ice age? Do I give the kingdom of darkness cause for concern? Is the devil afraid of you? Well, I'm not Mr. Devil. He ain't afraid of nobody. He's crazy. He's not even afraid of God. He's stupid. But little devils, are they afraid of you? These little imp devils that bug you and bug people. Uh, you know, they're not afraid of me or you because of us. They're afraid of us because of who we know and how much of him we have in our life. Do you understand that? You can face the biggest devil in the world or the smallest one if you're weak in, in the Lord and get beat up by the littlest, punkiest devil, if, if there's such a thing. But you know, when you're strong in the Lord and the power of his might, the enemy doesn't like being around you because the light of God in you burns him, makes him uncomfortable. Praise God. So do you give the kingdom of darkness cause and concern? What impossible thing are you believing for and planning for this coming year? Impossible thing. Now there's some things that seem impossible to me right now. What am I believing for? Is it about me or is it for somebody else? I think it's time to believe for some other people, not just you. But you should believe for you too. What are my most prevailing thoughts? Well, I've got to tell you, sometimes in the middle of the night, they're not so great. They're tormenting thoughts. If you're tormented at night, sometimes you need to do what I did today and make sure that you and God are cool because then if you're cool, cool and at peace with God, those tormenting thoughts need to be rebuked and they have to go in Jesus' name. Okay? And sometimes uh, the Bible talks about when you, when you don't walk right towards other people or you're not right towards God, he hands you over to the tormentors. Does that mean God's like, get him, devil? It just means he steps back. You know, when the Bible talks about turning one over for, for the destruction of their flesh to Satan, I don't ever believe in praying that over anybody, but sometimes when people won't listen to me anymore and they're going down a road and you're trying to get the word into them and divine counsel to them, but they won't listen, it's time for you to step aside and, and go minister to people that will listen to you and hope that they'll come around eventually. That's giving them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh because if you're not covering them in prayer or you're not counseling them or they won't listen to people, they won't listen to divine counsel from God's word, then they're, they're a target for the enemy. And so sometimes the tormentors, even though they seem bad at the time, they can be a good motivating factor to get you uh, to forgive people, to get you to get right with God, to get you to quit doing things that God has been telling you to quit doing, habits to give up. So when we move into this next year, we need to think about these things. So we need to be, we need to be re ready to repent and willing to change. Repent means to change your mind, go in the opposite direction. Okay? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says and, and 10, uh, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. John, uh, 1 John 2, 1 says, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So repentance brings a refreshing. It gets our minds right. When we have a come to Jesus meeting with the Father, we're going to find out he's right and we're wrong. And then when we admit and confess our faults, our sins to him, he, that opens the door for him to heal us and to deliver us from all righteous, unrighteousness and cleanse us. Amen? So Peter said once again in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Then, you notice the, the succession here? You repent, your sins are blotted out, then the times of refreshing come. So when we're going through stuff, 
we can find re refreshing. Last one here. So here we are. We, we, re <clears throat> we reflect. We repent. And we recommit. To recommit is a pledge to something undertaken in trust to one another's care. Okay, so we're going to entrust, recommit, and trust uh, ourselves into God's care. Philippians 3.8 says, Yet indeed I also count all those things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. So there's some things that we need to count as rubbish, whether they're in the past, whether they're things that we need to quit doing. Not all just, you know, these resolution things, like I'm going to lose weight, or I'm going to quit smoking, or I'm going to quit this, or I'm going to quit. Those are all good things, possibly, especially if God's telling you to do it. But more than anything, it's a recommitment to God, amen? To put your trust back into the Lord uh, and, and make Him number one in your life again. And count everything else secondary. Well, you know, when I think of things as rubbish, I don't necessarily mean everything is to throw away. A lot of times for me, it's just putting them in the proper order. So, you know, I mean, if music or television or social media or all these things take precedence over God or gaming, whatever it is you like to do, knitting, I don't know, if you knit, you can probably pray while you're knitting, but, you know, whatever it is that you, that you like to do, golfing, baseball, whatever, you know, God needs to be first. Give him his portion. And then, then it's okay that if you pick some of those things up. Amen? As long as they don't distract you from the, from the mission that God's put you on. Refocus, number four. Get a fresh perspective. Because when we repent, it means we're changing our mind and we're getting it lined up with the mind of Christ and we're walking the, a different direction. Amen. We're changing the way we think so we'll walk differently. Some of you need to change your direction and start walking with the Holy Ghost again. You go, I just don't know how to do all that. Well, I ain't got time to tell you how to do all that. The Word of God is your, is your map. It's not just Pastor Jim up here telling you what to do. It's, it's, it's the Word of God, and it's your, your relationship and your communication with the, with the Father. So refocus. If you refocus, you'll get a fresh perspective. Amen. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus this coming year. And number five, redirect your energy and your resources. There's got to be priorities in your life. So redirect your energy and your resources to the things of God. Yes, it's great to come to church every week like you do or any service you can. But it's not, church is not the end all be all. Life at home has got to be a, a particular rhythm and rhyme. Amen. We're coming to an end of a season. You need to say to yourself, if you're in, you find yourself in a place of where your relationship with God, you're convicted as you reflect, you need to, you need to see that this, this season's coming to an end. I'm going to let it go into the past, and I'm moving forward with Christ. Say, but I've done that 100 times. You know what? Try being a Christian for 48 years. You've probably done it 200 times. Love the Lord. The thing is, is you do it. You know, the cool thing about God is, you know, he meets you where you're at every time. What he wants, he wants a heart that's towards him. And when it's not, we need to get it directed back towards him. We're coming into days where our relationship with God and with each other has got to be right. Amen? It could mean life or death. It could mean ministry or going home to be with the Lord early, which is cool. But, you know, there's unfinished business. When you leave the, when you leave the earth at, at, before your time, there's unfinished business. Somebody else has got to pick it up, or maybe it never gets done, and maybe people are lost. You need to look at it that way, that if I'm not walking with God like I should be and I'm not being, I'm not being focused on him, how many people will go to hell? I don't know that, that Lynn's in hell or in heaven today. As far as I know, she was a Jew, didn't know the Messiah, and if nobody got to her before I had a chance to talk to her, she's probably dead and in hell. A sweet girl. You know, she was a normal person. It wasn't like she never did anything wrong. But she was a, basically a good person. You know how many good people are in hell right now because they didn't know Jesus? Or because somebody didn't bring the gospel to them? Bunches of them. And you could get mad at God or you could say, I don't understand. I don't understand it either. But you know what? I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not going there for anybody. Can you say amen? Jesus already did it for me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together. Thank you that we're coming into a new season, Lord. 
Check our hearts, Lord. Check our minds. Give us that, that uh, ability, Father, to see your will, to see your heart, and to move in accordance with your will and in accordance with your heart. And basically, Father God, uh, help us understand your word as it pertains to us individually, not just corporately, but us individually. And we, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. If you're in agreement, say amen and God bless you.